Well, good evening again. I'll start with a question. Are you a butterfly or a bumblebee? Now, let me explain the difference first of all. A butterfly dances from flower to flower. They get its contents from that flower off the surface, pollen, those kind of things. But a bumblebee is less graceful. A bumblebee goes beneath the surface. A bumblebee goes way down in the flower, if need be, in order to get what it's after. It's willing to go deep into the flower. It is the worker, whereas the butterfly is more graceful and majestic, but probably is unable to, but nevertheless doesn't go as deep as the bumblebee. And when it comes to Bible study, we need to be a bumblebee rather than a butterfly. There's enough butterflies in the world when it comes to Bible study. Enough people simply glance at Scripture. They pick a a verse out of context. They do a surface reading. We need hard-working bumblebees that are willing to dig deep into the Scriptures to discover as many of the riches that are available to us as possible. And that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And tonight we're looking at being a detailed-oriented person when it comes to the Bible. Many of you here are detail-oriented people. I'm a details person. It used to drive my players crazy. I, I was big into details. When you run line drills, you touch the line. You don't just bend over, you actually touch it. You make sure that, that you're paying attention to every little detail because details, I believe, are what get you beat. And I believe that's the case in life. I mean, if you don't pay attention to details, eventually you're going to be defeated. And I think it's that way in Bible study. If you're not going to pay attention to the details, you're really not going to get the most out of your Bible study. This can be intimidating. Bible study is intimidating for a lot of people. It becomes even more intimidating when we don't have a strategy. And so that's, that's where we're coming from in this series of lessons. is trying to give us a strategy so that we can tackle this intimidating process. We're going to begin tonight by discussing observation. There are really three different aspects of Bible study that we're going to look at over the next three weeks. First is observation, which is kind of laying the foundation. Second is interpretation, which is about building a solid structure on observation or on the foundation. And then last of all is application, which is about just living in the structure, living in harmony with God's will, enjoying your abode. We must get that foundation right if we're ever going to expect to get the rest of it right. Because if you start with a bad observation, you will never get to a correct interpretation, nor will you see the proper application. And there are a lot of doctrinal errors that have been made because observation was lacking. For instance, if you were to look at the book of Revelation, and you were to discern that the book of Revelation was written in literal language. Now, no, it's not. It's written in apocalyptic language. But if you were to decide that this was written in literal language, well, guess what? You're not going to come to the proper interpretation, and thus you're not going to have the proper application. So the doctrine of premillennialism, dispensational, the, 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 those that go together, they all stem from a wrong observation. And so we've got to be careful here. We've got to make sure that we lay the proper foundation. We've also got to understand that all of these are tied together. They don't stand alone. You cannot just operate in observation. Okay, that's just laying the foundation. At some point, you've got to build on that and go to interpretation. And then, of course, you need to ask the question, so so what? What's What's this mean for me? Why does this matter? And that's where we all want to get to is the practical application. You know, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, we find the Ethiopian eunuch is reading a portion of the book of Isaiah. He's observing it. But guess what? He was having trouble. And so Philip is brought on the scene to help him interpret and apply it. And he does. So it's always going to be difficult. There's always going to be an intimidation when it comes to studying the Bible. We're never going to properly understand every single thing without some help. But we've got to get the first step right. Observation is key. It has to do with the big picture. It asks the question, what do I see? What am I looking at here? What is the overall theme? Who is the author writing to? What is the message they're trying to get across? And this can be done for for the book, uh, of the, uh, be done for the Bible entirely, but it can be done for a specific book in the Bible as well. I mean, you take Hebrews chapter 11, for instance. You'll ask the question, okay, what's the theme of Hebrews chapter 11? 
What's the point that they're trying to get across? What's the summary of Hebrews chapter 11? That's what we're doing with observation. It's laying the foundation. You know, when you go to build a house or some sort of structure, you don't just start by digging random holes. I mean, if you're me, you do. But I mean, if you're somebody that knows what you're doing, you don't start by digging random holes. You know, you, you lay out a plan. You devise some blueprints, perhaps. I mean, you, you draw it out. You, you know what you're getting into before you ever start to excavate, right? And that's what observation is. It's kind of this, this 30,000-foot view. And then we get into even the finer details of interpretation and application. You know, the psalmist prayed, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from thy law. Was he not asking God to help him to observe? I, mean, I think that's the question he was, he was posing to God. Help me, open my eyes that I may behold the wonderful things from thy law to have the insight that's necessary to see what it is you're trying to get across so that I may understand it and apply it to my life. So, that being said, let's look at some principles of observation. I told you, you might want to bring a notebook and a pen. If I go too fast, feel free to slow me down. But here's what we're looking at with principles of observation. First of all, when you're reading the Bible, read thoughtfully. You know, the Bible is not for, Bible reading, I should say, is not for the thoughtless and lazy. You've heard me say this before. God never intended us to approach the Bible by first taking out our brain and laying it aside. And I think sometimes that's what people do. Don't be thoughtless or lazy when it comes to Bible study. Be thoughtful. Think about what it is that you're reading. All of us have done this. We've read a passage of the Bible, we put it down, and we walk away, and we don't even know what we read. Because we were daydreaming, we were going in a in hundred different directions, we had a, a hard time just shutting off. Do your best to block out all the white noise, to just think about what it is that you're reading. Read thoughtfully. And start with the shorter books of the Bible. If you're new to Bible study, start with some of the shorter books. Take, take the book of Philemon, for instance. Ask these questions. How would you summarize this book's message in one sentence? What can you find out about the relationship between Paul and Onesimus and, and Philemon? What feelings might be involved with each person? What issues does the book speak to? Why is this book significant? And why is it included in the New Testament? We need to ask that of every book, right? Why is it here? What does God want me to know from this? So, read thoughtfully. Read repeatedly. It's okay to read something over and over again. I mean, if you're like me, sometimes I have to read a passage several times before I actually get it to sink into my brain. And you know as well as I do that the more you read the Bible, you find things that you never noticed before. You can read something over and over again. You could read Hebrews chapter 11 a hundred times and find something New and rich every time, right? So read repeatedly. Read it over and over. Read prayerfully. You know, we often talk about spiritual disciplines and we talk about Bible study and prayer. Those two are not mutually exclusive. They don't have to be. They can go together. And in fact, they should go together. Pray before you study. Pray as you're studying the Bible. Pray after you study the Bible. Ask God, what is it you want me to discern here? And how do you want me to apply this to my life? Put them together. You pray during your Bible study? Hopefully you do. Another thing is to read imaginatively. I think this helps me somewhat to put myself in the setting. Imagine myself being there in that day and time. Maybe imagining myself being in the audience as the letter to the Philippians is read. Maybe imagining myself following on the heels of Jesus as he is, as he is walking this earth and, and teaching and preaching. Imagining myself in the crowd that day as he gave that famous Sermon on the Mount. Read imaginatively. Think about yourself being there in that day and that time. And also, like we talked about last week and the week before, Use different translations. It's okay to compare and contrast. Use some different versions. And, and of course, there are some that are not worth the paper they're printed on, but use a valid version or translation and, and look at different ones and kind of see how it, how it paints the picture for you. And then read purposefully. Have a purpose for your Bible study. Here's some helpful hints. Who are the people in the text? Who are they and what do they say? 
What is happening in the text? What are the events that are going on? Where is this all taking place? When is it taking place? And why is it taking place? And then wherefore? Or so what? You hear me say that a lot. I mean, when it comes to my preaching or a Bible class or Bible study, you should always end up with the question, so what? So what does this have to do with me? What is, how does this help me? How does this apply to me? That's reading purposefully. The process of observation is kind of similar to a, a miner who is maybe digging for precious metals and uh, you know, looking for you know, certain, certain minerals or whatever it may be. And so they, they take a, a 30,000 foot view. Maybe they use an airplane or a helicopter and they're looking for a certain area and they find that certain area. Maybe it's a mountain range somewhere and then they narrow it down to maybe one certain mountain or some sort of area within the area that they have been looking at. And then they, they pinpoint a certain area that they believe what will produce what they're looking for. And then they start to dig. They don't just go out and start digging in random places. Those of you in the oil business know what I'm talking about. Or if you have a, if you have a smartphone and you're, uh, you're looking on maps and maybe you don't know the specific address and so perhaps you type in the name of the town and you go to that town you use your fingers and you, you zoom in a little closer and you find you know maybe some certain streets or something and you zoom in even closer to try to find the exact location of what you're looking for. If you ever use Google Earth, you've probably done that. And you keep zooming in, you keep zooming in until you can find your own house, right? That's what observation does. It keeps zooming in until we get to the finer details and we can lay that foundation and go forward. That's what it means to observe. And observation is really broken up into three basic steps. The whole, the individual parts, and the fine details. When observing the big picture, consider these things. Read, record, identify, evaluate, summarize, list, share, and save. When we read, we're reading the entire section. I always uh, encourage folks to do this when you're reading. Don't just read half the book, all right? If you can read the entire book, that's great. If you can read the entire chapter, that's good too. But just reading one paragraph, I would caution you against that. I know you know, sometimes we, we approach Bible study and we try to do it briefly and squeeze it in, but if you can set out more time to read the entire book, if it's a shorter book, or at least read the entire chapter that you're engaged in, now sometimes that's hard. I mean, you're going to read Psalm 119 in one setting. I mean, that can be difficult, right? But as much as possible, let's see if we can read the entire section so that we can understand the whole. Observation is about the whole, so let's see if we can take in the whole. Record or make some notes to what you have observed. A few years ago, I, I ordered a, uh, a journaling Bible, ESV journaling Bible. It's what I use at home, and it has, it has margins on the side where you can write and record. It's a really good tool, and so if you'd like to pick one of those up, you can order them on Amazon or probably at a, at a bookstore somewhere. Those are really good tools. Identify. Identify each paragraph, maybe. Label, label it. Title it. What's going on in that paragraph? And then evaluate it. Evaluate each paragraph in light of the others. How are they connected? How do they go together? How do they relate? Then summarize the thought in each section. You know, what is God trying to get across to me here? What's the summary of all this? If I was to boil it down, what would it say? List any questions or problems that you've encountered. Share the results of your study with someone. Do you talk to your spouse about what you've studied? Maybe your classmates, maybe... You know, someone else that you're close to, share your results, save your work, keep files. I mean, if you record it in your Bible, that's great. If not, if you have a notebook or something like that, keep up with that and record it somewhere and save it. Now, my guess is most of us don't go to this trouble when we study the Bible. And you may be saying to yourself, so I'm supposed to do all of this and, and wait because there's a whole lot more. But you may be saying to yourself, so I've got to do all of this every time I sit down and study the Bible? No. I mean, but we want a strategy, right? You may not do all of this, but I would hope that you do some of it to help you and, and to have some sort of working strategy when you go to the Bible. Because I think what so many people have done for so long and Christians have done for so long is they just sit down, they read a passage, they close it up until the next day and they, they do it all over again. 
Or they have their Bible reading plan, and that Bible reading plan becomes a stressor, doesn't it? I've got to get through three chapters today, and so we read through it real quick so we can check it off the list, and then we move on, right? That's not the purpose. The purpose for Bible study, no matter how much we're reading, is is the quality of it, not quantity necessarily, quality. What are we getting from this? Are we laying a proper foundation? Are we interpreting it correctly, and are we applying it to where it's useful? All Scripture has a fourfold purpose, and Paul laid this out in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's the fourfold purpose. Doctrine, what's right. Reproof, what's not right. Correction, how do I get it right? And then training in righteousness, how to stay right. That's what Paul said. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. There are no accidents in Scripture. They all have a meaning. They all mean something. They all correlate or connect to the main theme. And so, therefore, it's important for us to dig deep, to strain out as much meaning from it as we possibly can. I mean, if we want to be a a true and authentic and genuine disciple, that's what we should be seeking, is to squeeze out every ounce of meaning from the Scripture. If God is communicating with us, we should want that for us, right? So let's look at some common forms of structure very quickly. Here are 10 common forms of structure. This is what we get into when we talk about the finer details of observation. When you're reading a certain book or a certain chapter, maybe even a certain passage, here's some things that might help you in understanding. First of all, comparison. And we see this in words like, well, like, or uh, words like also or as or to. A good example of this would be 1 John 4 and 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? There's that word greater, or, you know, Hebrews 4 and 12, sharper than any two-edged sword, or Psalm 1, 3 through 4, we see the the comparison between godly and ungodly. So, uh, comparisons, you know, look for those, see if that stands out when you're studying the Bible. A contrast, is there a contrast? Is there an association between things that are unlike or dissimilar or opposite? These key terms would be the words but or yet. Psalm 1 contrasts the righteous man with the ungodly man. Or Galatians 5, 19 through 23 is a contrast between the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, right? So you have contrast. Look for that. And look for repetition. In in what you're reading, is it repeating things over and over again? Are there terms or phrases that are used two or more times to, to grab your attention? You know, for instance... Psalm 136, his steadfast love endures forever, is repeated over and over again. In Hebrews chapter 11, what's the phrase that you hear so often, or that you read so often? By faith, right? You see that over and over again in Hebrews chapter 11. So circle that, underline it in your Bible, keep up with it. There's some repetition there. And then also cause and effect. Look for one action that leads to another action, okay? 1 John 4, 19, we love him. Because he first loved us, right? Because he first loved us. That's a cause and effect. Romans 1, 24 through 32 says that God gave up the wicked to uncleanness because they did not glorify him and they exchanged the truth of God for lies. Or Galatians 6, 7 through 8, the causes are sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. The effects are corruption or eternal life. So there's there's cause and effect there. Explanation or reason is another one. It's the presentation of an idea or an event followed by its interpretation. An example of this would be Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 3, you know, the parable of the sower. It is stated, but then the parable of the sower is later explained, right? So sometimes the Bible lays it out for us pretty simply. Jesus actually explains what it is that he wants us to know. Sometimes in the book of Revelation, the symbolism is explained for us. And so there can be an explanation or a reason. Acts 11, 1 through 18, Peter explains the events relating to Cornelius' conversion to the brethren of Judea. So we have explanation or reason. We also have proportion. Think about the emphasis and the, the, the amount of space or emphasis that is placed on, 
on certain things, uh, maybe a subject or a person. For instance, Genesis chapters 1 through 11, there are four key events, right? There's creation, there's the fall, there's the flood, then there's Babel, okay? So you have four key events there. There's a lot of attention given to those events. Or in Genesis 12 through 50, you have four key people there, right? And it tells their story. You have Abraham, you have Isaac, you have Jacob, and you have Joseph. So you can pay attention to proportion. Also pay attention to pivot or hinge. How a story is playing out and then it switches gears. And the one that comes to my mind is the story of David. You know, David is rocking along. He is a rock star, right? I mean, he is, he is famous. He is doing well. He uh, just conquered, you know, the giant, cuts his head off. Everybody's praising him and singing about him. And then things change for David, don't they? There's a hinge or a pivot there. After his sin with Bathsheba, things really change. So that's an example of a pivot or a hinge. Then look for purpose as well. Every now and then in the Bible, we have these purpose statements, and sometimes they're very clear. For instance, in John chapter 20, in his gospel, starting in verse 30, he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John lays it out. He says, this is the purpose. This is why I wrote this book. And we see it in 1 John. 1 John, he gives a statement in, uh, in, in chapter 5 where he gives a declaration as to why he's writing these words, so that you may believe, so that you can have assurance. So sometimes we see that purpose statement very clear. Sometimes we have to decipher it a little bit. And then look for question and answer. You know, Malachi does that. In Malachi chapters, uh, well, chapter 1 and, and then also in chapters 2 and 3, he asks a series of questions with divine answers. He'll say, how has God loved us? How have we despised him? How have we profaned the covenant? How have we wearied God? How have we robbed God? How have we spoken against God? Question and answer. Remember in the book of Job, you have some of that too, right? God asks Job some questions. So we have question and answer. And then we have specific to general or general to specific. Uh, specific. Sometimes when we look at the Bible, we see a progression of thought. Maybe from lesser to greater or greater to lesser. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, the general principle is stated in verse 1, while specific examples are given with the wrong kind of giving, the wrong kind of praying or fasting. In James chapter 2, 1 through 13, verse 1 gives us the general principle, while verses 2 through 13 get more specific about the point. These are examples of progression, or excuse me, specific to general progression or general to specific. Scripture has a structure. Every literary work has a structure. And Scripture is no different. The Bible is no different. There is structure in place. And this is not the only structure you'll find, but these are you know, some of the more common forms. That may help you when you, when you study to look at these, these forms these common forms of structure, maybe to help you to maybe make some notes and understand it a little better. But here's what I want to close with. I want to close with looking at just some simple questions that, uh, that are related to observation, just some key questions to observation, all right? And feel free to take a Sharpie and write on your fingers if it helps you. Uh, that's up to you. But here's what we're looking at when we look at key observation questions. And we use a hand because that's just an easy way to remember it. Okay, we see that the, the thumb is who? Who is the writer? Who are the recipients? Who are the main characters? That's an easy one, right? And then ask the question with the index finger of what? What are the key truths? What are the key ideas or circumstances? And then where? Where is this taking place? What's the location? What places are emphasized? Sometimes you don't have that. Sometimes there's not an answer to that question. But a lot of times there is. Then the ring finger is when. What's the timeline? What's the historical period? Past, present, future. What, what's the time frame here? And then the pinky finger is how. How do the characters and or events show or fail to show something of God and His will? And then the palm is why. 
Why is this in God's Word? Why is the book of Ruth in God's Word? You know, so you, you read the book of Ruth, you ask that question, you say, okay, why did God include this? Right? So, those are just some, some examples of key observation questions. They're, they're really good questions when you're studying a passage, and then you have, you have your hand right there, and you can kind of refer to it and say, okay, what's the, the who, what, where, when, how, those kind of things. You know, the, again, this may not be something you do every time you sit down and study the Bible. But again, we just, we want a strategy. You know, if you'll remember back in, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus said at least 12 times, he uttered the phrase, have you not heard? Now, if you think about that, who was he speaking to mainly? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Have you not heard? Or he says, have you not read? Have you not read? These were the most well-read people around. You realize that, right? These, these people had read. They were the most studied around. But they had not interpreted, they had not discerned correctly. Something failed either in the observation process or interpretation or application and of course, we know their heart wasn't right to begin with as well. But Jesus is saying, have you not read? Yes, they had read. But you hadn't read it and applied it correctly. And that's where we want to get to. We want to make sure that we're observing and laying that foundation and then building a solid structure. And then we can live in our abode and let the Word of God change us. Next week, we're going to look at interpretation. You know, you've heard me say over and over again, it's not about you. Well, next week it's going to be about you. Because when it comes to interpretation and application, it's about you. And we're going to make it personal. So be here next week. If we can help you in any way tonight, if, there is a, uh, if you need us to pray with you or love and support you in any way, um, if you're somebody who is ready to study the Bible and you want to set up a study with me or one of the elders or some of the members here are willing to do that, let's do that. Uh, and if you're ready to put on Christ in baptism, certainly we want to take care of that as well. Please don't leave tonight without being right with God, but also remember our charge every week. Let's go out and let's change the world. Let's be more studious in the Bible.